How many of you, you like mysteries? Does anybody like mysteries, books, uh, TV shows, novels? Nobody. What do you do, just read your Bible and pray all the, day, all the time? Like, what in the world? Our 8.30 service was like, we don't like mysteries either. And so uh, I have, I'm going to disappoint you then in the beginning of our message because I was going to unravel a biblical mystery with you, but you already hate mysteries. And so I don't know. You probably already know what I'm going to share anyway. And so it's not even a mystery. But I love this story of a man named Ahithophel in the Old Testament. Now, this first verse we're going to read together is not going to be encouraging. Let's just jump right in. Here's what we read in 2 Samuel chapter number 17. It says, When Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He set his house in order and hanged himself, so he died and was buried in his father's tomb. Welcome to church. You got up this morning, got your kids ready, come to church, and now we read a verse about a guy hanging himself. Like, What in the world? Well, the question is, who is Ahithophel? Why did he meet such a tragic demise? Well, there's a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 27 that tells us that Ahithophel was the king's counselor. So he was King David's trusted advisor. So why did he end up hanging himself? Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, uh, here's why Ahithophel was so valuable to David. Now, the advice that Ahithophel gave in those days was like someone asking about a word from God. So David, when he would seek out the advice and wisdom from his trusted advisor, Ahithophel, it was like he was hearing a word from the Lord. So what happened? Why did he end up hanging himself? We just read a moment ago. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we find this. It says, while he was offering the sacrifices, Absalom, who was David's younger son, sent for David's advisor, Ahithophel, the Gilanite, so the conspiracy grew strong and the people supporting Absalom continued to increase. Now, there's a branch of the story we don't have time to get into, but basically Absalom was trying to mutiny against his father, David, to wrestle the king, kingdom away and become king of the nation of Israel. So he goes after David's most trusted advisor, Ahithophel, to pull him over to his side. And look what happens in the next verse. We find this in verse, uh, 2 Samuel 16. It says, Absalom and the Israelites came to Jerusalem, and look who was with him, Ahithophel. So Ahithophel now turns his back on David, joins the mutiny of Absalom, and look what happens next. We find this in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Someone reported to David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom, so David cries out, Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. So now we have this weird turn of events where we have Ahithophel saying, I'm rejecting King David, I'm going to go on Team Absalom, and we're going to overthrow Uh, David. But look what happens in 2 Samuel 17. Ahithophel brings some counsel to Absalom, and here's what he says. Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will set out in pursuit of David tonight. I will attack him while he was weary and discouraged, throw him into a panic, and all the people with him will scatter. And look what Ahithophel says next. I will strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. Now, verse 4, this proposal seemed right to Absalom and all the elders of Israel. But then Absalom goes to another advisor named Hushai. And in verse number 7, Hushai says to Absalom, the advice that Ahithophel has given this time is not good. So here's the story. Absalom is trying to overthrow his dad. Ahithophel, this trusted advisor, this man who speaks words from God, goes to Absalom and says, hey, give me a chance to just take out the king. I want to destroy him and I'll bring everyone back and you will be the king. And Absalom rejects the counsel, so we go back to the verse we just read a moment ago that says in uh, 2 Samuel 17, when Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and he hangs himself. So who was Ahithophel? Well, if you go on to later in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we read this list uh, as David is near death. It says, among the 30, and these were 30 mighty men, mighty warriors of David, but look what we find in verse 34. Among the 30 were Eliam, son of Ahithophel. Now, Ahithophel's son was one of David's mighty warriors, so uh, Eliam and David were all, and, and Ahithophel were all in on King David. Like, they were all in on the kingdom, and they were helping support. They were giving wisdom. They were providing the mighty power. So what turned Ahithophel against David? Well, now we find ourselves at a familiar story in 2 Samuel 17, or rather, 2 Samuel 11, where it says, One evening, David got up from his bed, strolled around on the roof of the palace, from the roof he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. 
So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah? David, as you maybe know the story, takes Bathsheba, has his own, has her husband Uriah killed at battle, and then the, the baby that was produced from this affair dies. So we can surmise from the story and unraveling this mystery that Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. Now think about this. Ahithophel, standing back, looking over his family, sees his precious granddaughter being abused, being uh, just her life destroyed by King David, who he had been giving his life to. So the last third of Ahithophel's life, roughly, was spent in bitterness, was spent in unforgiveness, was spent in hating David to the point that he goes to Absalom and says, I will kill your father. And Absalom rejects that, and so instead, Ahithophel killed himself. Paul tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Today I want to talk about a kind of a loaded topic, if you will, and a loaded subject, but I want to talk about peace through forgiveness. Forgiveness. You see, Ahithophel wasn't able to forgive David for what he had done to his family, and as a result, it ended up changing the trajectory of his life, where he was the man who, who heard from God, who was the voice of God, the mouthpiece, to now he's just hanging himself and ending his life prematurely. You know, that word forgiveness was a powerful word for me. It hit me really hard when I was going uh, through a divorce, and I remember finding a book called New Life After Divorce. And I, I, this is written by a, a, a licensed family marriage and therapist. He's a Christian, and he went through his own divorce, and so he's de detailing his story of divorce. And I remember coming across this book, and for the first five chapters, it was outstanding. I'm like, this is so good. This is so helpful. And then I came to chapter six. Chapter 6 is the personal power of forgiveness. I read that word, and I literally, I know I'm exaggerating, I literally could not read any further. I closed the book, I put it on my shelf, and I left it there for months because I just had a hard time walking in forgiveness. I want to encourage you, as we think about the fruit of the Spirit, these are not just actions that the world can produce. These are, these are really organic, uh, life-changing, uh, just things that God, through his Holy Spirit, can produce in our life. And let me tell you, you will not discover, you will not walk in the peace that God has for you until you are walking in forgiveness. And so today, for our next few moments, I want to share with you just some thoughts, some things that uh, we f see from scriptures of, of how to know if you've really forgiven. We throw this word a, a lot around where we say, yeah, I've forgiven them. I know that I'm walking in forgiveness, but there's some things in our life that really are telltale signs that we're actually not really walking in forgiveness. And so I'm going to share with you four indicators of how to really know that you are walking in forgiveness. You will not experience the peace of God without the forgiveness from God. And so here's the first indicator that you'll know if you've really forgiven, and that's, this is a hard one, but you'll know if you've been really forgiving people if you don't bring up the past. You don't bring up the past. Here's what we find in our passage in Romans chapter 12. Paul is saying, he says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And then he says in verse 18, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then he says in verse 19, Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. If you continually bring up the past, you are not walking in forgiveness. Now, I don't know about you, but my, in my family, my wife is the historian of our family. If you're the historian of your family, would you raise your hand like you remember everything about your family? You're nervous right now. You're not going to like raise your hand because you're like, is this a trap? What's going to happen right now? 
And I remember, you know, my wife, she'll ask me about basic things about growing up, and I don't remember. Like, she'll like, well, how was this? I'm like, I don't know. I had a good childhood. Well, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know, we had a dog one time, and we had a cat sometimes. Like, I was just, it was a fun childhood. She, then she'll get with my sister, uh, and she'll say, well, what happened then? And my sister, because she's a historian of her family, and she's like, Jeremy, you don't remember what this happened, and then this happened, and then you know what Amy and my sister Stephanie do? They get together and shame me for not remembering anything from the past. Like, this is, they gang up on me, and so it's not a fun situation, but uh, Amy is the historian of our family. She'll remember things, and she'll fill in details from even a few years ago, and it's, it's great to remind us of all the memories, but here's what I found. Historians make great storytellers but they make terrible forgivers. How many times have you brought up something that happened two decades ago? How many times have you, have you been in a conversation and you said, well, don't you remember when we first got married that you said that to me and you just celebrated 30 years of marriage? <laughs> and you're like, what? I was a baby when we were married. Like, I said all kinds of crazy things. But how many times do you and I bring up the past? You know, I've been around people who, when I'm with them, they bring up like the same three topics of conversation about certain people or situations. And it's not that they're forgetful. It's that they are unforgiving. Too many times you and I bring up the past. We're seeking the revenge that Paul is telling us about. And we're taking it away from the Lord. And we're saying, God, I actually don't trust that you'll bring re resolution to this. I need to do it myself and we are not walking in forgiveness. You see, you and I, if we know we've really forgiven, then we will not bring up the past. But there's another telltale sign, an indicator, if you will, of how to know if you've really forgiven, and that's this. You don't mind being in the same room with certain people. You know who they are. <laughs> They're people that, like, I came to church to worship Jesus, not think about them, and so now I have to think about that person. When you and I are walking in forgiveness, we're able to be in the same room with certain people. Here's what we read in Hebrews. It says, pursue peace with everyone and holiness, because without it, no one will see the Lord. And then he says in verse 15, the writer, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. I don't know about this, but I wonder if the opposite of peace is actually bitterness. And maybe if it's not the opposite, bitterness is certainly an enemy of peace. I found this recently, and, and I've promised to be real with you when I bring messages, and so I want you to know that there's things that I still struggle with. In fact, more recently, I, I was telling Amy, I saw a picture of someone, and it just stirred like this weird negative reaction in my heart. And I told Amy, I was like, I wasn't expecting to like have that reaction when I saw that picture. But often, you and I, we, we can't even be in the same room. We can't even see a picture of someone because we are struggling with unforgiveness. Now, we're going to get into some deeper things later because I know that there's things that have happened to you, there's things that are in your past that I'm not suggesting that you sweep under the rug, you gloss over and pretend like it never happened. We're going to talk about the deep work of forgiveness in a moment. But I want you to, to know that if you are just continually bringing up the past, if you see someone uh, at church or at work and you're like, oh, I can't even believe they're here, I don't even want to be in the same room, let me tell you, you're not walking in the peace that God has called you to. I came across this quote re uh, this past week where it says, bitterness is like the acid you have inside that you want to spew on others, but it may well eat you alive before you get the chance. Too many times bitterness gets into our soul. Ahithophel, that's exactly what happened to him. He saw his granddaughter, this tragic, terrible thing that David had done to his family, and he allowed that bitterness to just become like acid and eat him from the inside out, where for the last 13 years of his life, he couldn't think of anything other than destroying King David. There's a third indicator to know that if you're truly walking in forgiveness, and that's this, your thoughts are more peaceful and hopeful than bitter and irritated. We find this in Ephesians chapter 4 where it says, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you. You see, you show me a person that's constantly irritated and I'll show you a person that's constantly struggling with forgiveness. 
Too often, you and I, we spend our, our time just thinking about uh, being irritated and being annoyed at these people and what they've done and, and the, 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 tra- the havoc that they've wreaked in our life. And all of a sudden now, we're just so focused on being bitter and being irritated that we cannot handle the idea that God wants us to have a peaceful and even hopeful life. Last week, we spent our time together talking about bringing blessing from God into our life through giving. This week, we're talking about bringing peace of God into your life through forgiveness. You see, the fruit of the Spirit aren't just nice topics to talk about at church. They're not just these things that love, joy, peace, patience. These are fun, just Bible words to live. These are life-changing fruits that God wants to produce in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love this verse that I uh, came across this past week in the book of Isaiah. This prophet, he writes this in chapter 38, verse 17, where he says, Behold, instead of peace, I had bitterness upon bitterness. But thou hast in love delivered my soul from the pit of destruction. Thou hast cast all my sins behind your back. Jesus, you came, uh, maybe you came with a burden of bitterness. Jesus wants to release that. Maybe you came with this burden of unforgiveness where there's just something that someone did to you that you cannot get over. You are not letting go of the past. You can't even be in the same room as them. Your thoughts are always irritated. Your thoughts are always just, how can they have done that? What did they, they were, what they ruined me. And many times you and I just live in this. We just think that this is just our life. This is just what it's supposed to be. But there is a better way. You'll know that you're walking in forgiveness with our last indicator. If you're able to be at peace in the presence of your friends and your enemies. Proverbs chapter 16, we we read this verse. It says, when a person's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You see, one of the differences between the fruits of the Spirit and the world's view of love, joy, peace, and others is that it's easy in the world to love your friends, to love those who do things for you, to love those who support you and build you up. But the difference with the fruit of the Spirit is that you can still love those who use you. You can still love those who despise you. You can still love those who are your enemies. And when you can love your enemies, you'll know that it's the Holy Spirit's love that's being produced. It's his peace that's being produced in your life. And you'll know that you're living through the power of the Holy Spirit. But too often, you and I, we have this mentality that I am justified in my enemies. I am justified to not like and to not think about them. But too often, you and I forget that you and I were also enemies of God. How did God respond to you and to me being his enemies? Well, Romans 5 tells us in verse number 8, but God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in verse 10, uh, Paul goes on to say, for while you and, and while we, while I was still enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son then how much more, having been reconciled, will be saved by his life? A couple weeks ago, we talked about you and I as Christians are called to the ministry of reconciliation. That word reconciliation just means to restore. We're to connect. We're to say, hey, I know that you've done this, and I've done this, but we're going to get over it. We're going to forgive each other. We're going to restore. But do you know another word for restoration is? Forgiveness. And so Jesus, as he is seeing you as his enemy, you have done wrong against him. I have done wrong against him. He doesn't seek to cast us aside and say, I will never forgive you. He gave his own life so that he would forgive you and would forgive me. I don't know if you're sensing a pattern in the fruits of the Spirit, but two weeks ago we said we love because he first loved us. Last week we said we give joyfully because he first gave to us. And today we're declaring we forgive peacefully because he first forgave us. You see, you and I are able to walk in forgiveness because we have been forgiven. The fruits of the Spirit are plainly evident in God the Father. Now, I only have a short amount of time with you, and I know that there's some nuances to this discussion, to this topic, and I know there's stories after stories, and and there's things that that go beyond a a 30-minute Sunday message. And so my friend Marquita, who you just heard from our video in a moment, a moment ago, she has just had this powerful story in her own heart of forgiveness, and she wanted to do something about it. So she ended up getting some education, some schooling, got a master's in dispute resolution. She really wants to make a difference, and so she's been doing these forgiveness workshops or seminars, really helping people find the root of what it is that is keeping them from walking in the peace 
from God. And perhaps maybe as you saw that video, you're like, man, could I like meet with her? And you can. Uh, We've been meeting many, many weeks ago, and and we were putting this together, and so this Saturday, on October the 8th, she's going to be here providing a free workshop from 9 to 12, where you can do some deep work of forgiveness. Now, it's a free thing we're providing to our church because we believe so strongly that you and I, if we cannot walk in the peace of God, if we cannot forgive those around us, we will never reach the full blessings that God has for our life. So maybe for some of you, God woke you up this morning. He brought you to church for you to connect in on Saturday. And maybe even right now, you need to say, I I need that. I I need to invest these three hours of my week so that I can live in the full blessing of God. Now, you might say, well, why does this matter? What is the point of all this? I read a story a few years ago. It was of a pastor who was doing a revival in Panama. And he was uh, preaching the message, and after the message, a lady came forward and after the service and said, "Uh, Pastor, would you please pray that God would clean the cobwebs out of my life? And the pastor was like, that's an interesting prayer, so sure, let's pray that God would clean the cobwebs out of your life. And so they prayed that first night, she left, the second night of the revival came, and the same lady came forward after the message and said, Pastor, I need you to pray again that God would clean the cobwebs out of my life. And the pastor was like, well, we just prayed last night, and we're believing that God's going to do that. And she said, no, Pastor, I needed you to pray again that God would clean the cobwebs out of my life. And so they prayed that God would clean the cobwebs out of her life. The third night the revival came, the same lady after the service came again. Pastor, I need you to pray again. I just need God to clean the cobwebs. And the pastor said, no, I am not praying for that. Took her by surprise, like, you're not going to pray for me? You're not going to pray that God would clean the cobwebs? No, we are not praying that. That is the wrong prayer. She said, well, what what are we going to pray? He said, tonight, we're praying that God kills the spider. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes what we do as Christians is we dust off our Bible, dust off our soul. We come to church. We say, God, just, just, you know, do some maintenance. Clean up some things. Don't get too invasive. Just clean out those cobwebs. Maybe you saw arachnophobia in the early 90s like I did, and you're terrified of spiders now for the rest of your life. And so the idea of God killing a spider brings back some trauma. But what I had thought this week is that too often we can go to church and just kind of mess around. We dress up, wear nice shoes, come in, make sure our kids are looking good. We have this, and we get our coffee, we get a seat, we're lifting our hands in worship. We want a nice, perhaps funny message from the pastor, and then we want to walk away, and that's it. We just prayed and asked God to clean out some cobwebs. But perhaps, perhaps, God brought you here today, and I don't believe it's by accident or coincidence. I don't believe it's by luck that you're here. I think, for some of you, You've been cleaning out the cobwebs for years. You've been saying, God, just however you can do without being too invasive in my life, just kind of do that because I've gotten pretty comfortable. But today, for you to experience the full peace of God, it's going to take some deeper work. It's going to take killing some spiders. It's going to take you taking a Saturday morning this Saturday and saying, all right, I've been, I've been walking around uh, on eggshells around this person. I've been bringing up the past far too much. I've been walking in unforgiveness for far too long that today, this week, some spiders in my life get killed. I'm going to kill that spider of bitterness. I'm going to kill that spider of unforgiveness. I'm going to kill that spider that's keeping me from walking with God. Let me, let me tell you, like, my job here, what God has called me to do, what God has even brought me through divorce from is to help you not just say yes to God, but to live a fully dedicated, committed life to him. And what that means is that you and I have to say, okay, God, there's that person, that person that I cannot forgive. There is that situation that I always bring up to my spouse. There's that thing that I hold over my kid's head, and they're in their adulthood now. I I just can't let it go. 
Today, church, we kill those spiders. Today, church, we say, God, I want your peace because my peace isn't working. There's a verse I didn't even touch on. It, Paul writes, he says, hey, you can have the peace that passes all understanding. You know what that means? That means it's peace that doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense to the world that you can go through what you went through and still walk in forgiveness. But do you know what that means? You can only experience that through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not the fruit of Jeremy. This is not the fruit of the highlands. This is not the fruit of you, because we know where that leads to, death and destruction. This is the fruit of the Spirit, and we walk in the Holy Spirit. And what that means is, what that means is, we've got to kill some spiders this week. Some of you think you can hide. I was told recently, I don't have a good poker face, so all my emotions show on my face, and so I can't hide any expressions, which is a curse, I think. I don't know. But some of us, we think we can hide what's happening, but it's all over your face. It's all over your life. I don't want to play around. Life is too short. God's mission is too great for us to just be on the sidelines with the enemy just keeping us back at bay. Let's kill those spiders, walk in peace, and show the world what true forgiveness looks like. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I have been praying for you all week long. I want to take a moment before we move on into our service of taking a moment to pray for those who need prayer who are walking in unforgiveness, who are walking without peace. You will not, you cannot walk in the peace of God without walking in forgiveness. Now, I'm going to pray for you, but my next step for you would be to come on Saturday and to join us, to join this time where we are making space to kill some spiders. But maybe that starts right now. Maybe that says, God, I need you to restore I need you to forgive. There's no one looking around. Every head is bowed, and this is a private moment between you and God, but I want to pray with you and pray for you. But if that's you and you say, Pastor Jeremy, there's someone, there's a certain someone that I have just had a hard time forgiving. I am not walking in the peace that doesn't make sense. And so I need prayer to take that next step to move forward in my walk with forgiveness. Would you be so bold, so honest, I won't embarrass you, but to raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeremy, would you pray with me right now? I, I see you. What, a, what an amazing thing that you're doing right now. You're acknowledging there's a spider in your life that you are ready to kill. And so God, we pray for those hands that are raised. I don't know every story that's behind that hand being raised, but you do. And Lord, I, I'm not here to minimize what, the trauma that's happened. I'm not here to, to dismiss it and say it doesn't matter. Lord, we're going to do some deep work this week in our soul to, to remove those spiders. But Lord, I pray even now a blessing on those. Would you bless their courage that they just took to a say, there's a spider. There's some unforgiveness. Lord, we, we are not reaching the full blessings of our life, but we can't walk in your forgiveness and walk in your peace. And so, God, I pray desperately for these people, dear men and women who love you, but have also had things happen to them. Would you please show them today and this week how much you love them? Would you show them how much they matter to you? But Lord, let us not just clear out the cobwebs. Let us not just do some surface work. Help us this week to kill some spiders. Help us this week to get on the right path for you. We're so grateful for what you're doing already in their lives. And we pray that this week would be a new week. It would be a, new, a different week, Lord. And it would be a week full of peace that they have not experienced in some time. Perhaps you're here today and you have never experienced the forgiveness of God for the very first time. You can't forgive unless you've been forgiven, and so perhaps you're sitting here and maybe you're new to church or maybe you've been coming for a while and you've never said yes to God for the very first time. I want to encourage you 
that if that's you and you've never said yes, if you've never fully experienced the forgiveness that God offers through his son Jesus, now is the time. I didn't embarrass those that raised their hand earlier, and I won't embarrass you now. But if you, that's you, you say, Pastor Jeremy, I want to say yes to God for the first time. I want to experience that forgiveness. Would you do me the honor of just raising your hand? I want to pray with you, lead you into a prayer. I don't want to miss you. I see you. What a great decision. I see you as well. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And the first step in being forgiven is saying yes to God. I see you. What a great decision that you're making today. For those that raise their hand in this room and for those that are watching online, pray something along these lines. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm a sinner. But would you forgive me? Would you clean me from the inside out and help me to walk in your ways? Thank you for loving me and for the gift of forgiveness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you help me celebrate those that raised their hand in this room? If you're watching at home, there's a QR code on your screen that you can just scan, and that will take you to a, a next step to connect in with us. If you are in person, there's these blue cards right in front of you in the, one of the seat pockets. You can grab one of those, take it to our Connect team. They would love to show you some next steps, put some resources into your hands. If you're watching from home, uh, would you grab some elements for communion? Today's the first Sunday of the month, and we want to celebrate. If you are in person and you did not yet get a cup with a cracker, make sure you raise your hand. One of our amazing ushers will make sure that you get a cup and a cracker to go along with what we're doing here as we celebrate communion. I was thinking about communion this week, and I don't think of a better picture of being at peace in the presence of your friends and enemies like the Last Supper. Jesus, as he was sitting there with his disciples, he washed their feet. Do you know whose feet he also washed? Judas Iscariot. Judas would partake of this last supper with Jesus and the rest of the disciples, and then he would go to the Roman officials, and he was going to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But as you read the story of the last supper, all you find from Jesus is peace. He was at peace in the midst of of his enemies. He was at peace in the midst of his friends. He was at peace for you and for me. And so Jesus, as he was there with his disciples, he took the bread and he said, this bread is representative of my body, which will be broken for you. He broke his body for his friends and his enemies. And he said, eat in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup. He said, this represents my blood, which is shed for you. There's no line that Jesus says, nope, it's not for you because I don't like you. It's not for you because I hate you. It's only for you and you. Nope, Jesus shed his blood for all. He forgave all. And so we drank to remember him. Jesus, we're grateful that you displayed perfect peace. In the presence of your enemies, Lord, you still displayed a peace that passed understanding that didn't make sense. And Lord, you walked something for us that we can walk with your power, with your strength, and with your presence. And I pray, Lord, this week that you would help us to walk in forgiveness that certain person that we see on social media, that person that we see in the office or in our neighborhood or in our, even in our extended family, that person that just brings back feelings of dredging up the past and we cannot forgive, help us to walk in forgiveness for that person. And so Lord, I pray this week you give us the peace that we have not experienced for quite some time. We forgive because you forgave us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.